Well, we are in part three of a series within a series. So our series is God Against All Odds in the book of Acts, and we're getting to the end of the book, believe it or not. And uh, so we've been in this storm, this major storm that Paul is in for a chapter and a half in Acts 27 and into chapter 28. And so today, we're looking at Acts 27, 27 to 36. And we didn't have someone read the scripture ahead of time because I didn't want to ruin the suspense for you. It's so suspenseful. We're going to walk through it, okay? Um, And I had hoped, I had planned, I had prepared to go right to verse 44, but realized by Friday, no, that would be far too long. And so we're going to stop at verse 36 because there's just so many lessons along the way. So here's where we are again. Uh, They started on a cargo ship full of grain and full of prisoners, so sailors, soldiers, and prisoners, 276 in all, we're going to learn by verse 37. And they've traveled, and we've seen the the travels up to here, but now they were planning to winter in Phoenix. They got blown off course, and they're somewhere lost in a storm because there is a major hurricane called Eurocladon that has hit them, okay? So that's where we're at. Now, we're also at the point, this is where we ended off in verse 26, that everyone on the ship has run out of hope. They've run out of hope. Have you ever run out of hope in your life? Maybe it's in some situation that you've been in and you just, you you felt like, I'm helpless now. I'm hopeless. I don't know which way to turn. Well, when we're there, we always can still have one hope left. One hope left, and that's God. But God, right? Whatever the circumstance, but God. And see, there's a a glimmer of hope for those on the ship because some guy, maybe a crazed con man prisoner named Paul, has said that an angel appeared to him the night before and actually told him that they're going to be fine. And and strangely, the guys on board are desperate enough for hope that they believed him. At least it seems that they did. And you've heard me say this before. Human extremity is God's opportunity. Human extremity is God's opportunity. So we'll walk through this text, but I was asked a great question this past week from verse 17. So let's, let's address that question. Um, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, and the person asked, how would one be able to pass ropes under a ship in a hurricane? That's a great question. And the answer is, with great difficulty. <laughs> right? Uh, it would take a ton of bravery slash foolishness, like this is a very high risk uh, moment, right? Having said that, I have known some young men who I think would, would have been willing to take a rope, jump off a ship in a hurricane to try it. To try. I have some stories that would support that conclusion. I won't tell them now, but... Um, yeah, I think, I think these were probably younger men who were willing to do this thing, and so somehow they got it done. It was a great question. Well, here's where we pick up the text in our reading today. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. A three-hour tour has turned into a two-week cruise from hello, this is going bad. (laughs) Now, I said it that way because there are many commentators who think that this storm was from hell, so to speak, that it came from the enemy, and it even has a a kind of a demonic name to it, Eurocladon, to thwart Paul's journey to Rome where he's going to be a major witness for Jesus in front of the emperor. And so it could have been a storm from hell, but they're 14 nights. So imagine that, 14 nights in this major storm. Secondly, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. Likely they heard the waves breaking on some nearby shore. That's how they would have sensed that. 
And then thirdly, from this verse, notice it mentions the Adriatic Sea. Now some have said, wait a minute, here's a contradiction in the Bible. Because they're in the Mediterranean Sea, now it's saying the Adriatic Sea. Well, have a look at the map. Yes, they are in the Mediterranean, but once you get up here, you're in the Sea of Adria. And it's the entire body of water east of Italy down to the southern tip. That was called the Adriatic Sea. I grew up in Wasaga Beach. And I, I remember for years I thought, well, the, the, the beach is Georgian Bay. It's Georgian Bay. And one day someone said, oh, you're on Lake Huron. And I said, no, we're on Georgian Bay. And they said, yeah, that's Lake Huron. Oh, it is? How can it be two places at the same time? But see, that's how it works. Depending on the location you're at, it's got a different name. Right? And so this is not a contradiction at all. It's a part of the Mediterranean Sea. Verse 28, they took soundings. Remember I mentioned that ancient mariners have studied this story to learn about how to navigate on ships because this is a very old story here, almost 2,000 years old. So they took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. So those who grew up on the metric system, I had to look this up, 36.5 meters, and then now it's 27.4 meters. But the point is this, it's getting more shallow because they're getting closer and closer to some approaching land. When you read the word soundings, it sounds so electronic, doesn't it? So, so, so modern. Well, there was no electronic depth finder on board this ship. This would have been a weight on the end of a rope. In fact, I looked up the word soundings. Bolizo literally means, listen to this, it literally means to heave the lead. So they heaved the lead that was tied to a rope. And once that lead hit the bottom, the rope would slacken. They would mark a spot on the rope. They would pull up the weight and take the measurement of the rope length. Very simple, but that's how they did it, and that's how the early mariners would have done it. Verse 29, fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for the daylight, for daylight. Do you remember last time, they thought that they were approaching Sirtis, which we saw on the map was North Africa. They thought they were further south than where they actually were. And Sirtis was known as a ship graveyard. It's where ships went to die because they would hit the rocks and be destroyed. And I was reminded this past week of the time that Karen and I spent uh, a weekend at someone's cottage on Purgatory Bay <laughs> up near Tobermory. And we had to ask the locals, why is it called Purgatory Bay? And the reason is that when the fish, fishing people would come in in the past, they would get stuck on the rocks. Sometimes for hours, sometimes for days, they'd be stuck on the rocks in Purgatory. <laughs> so the whole bay was called Purgatory Bay. And that's where this cottage was. Well, look what it says. They dropped four anchors from the stern likely trying to create as much drag as possible, but also maybe the hope that it might snag something. Maybe one of these anchors is going to catch something and we're not going to crash into the shore. Isn't it interesting at the end, though, they prayed for daylight? The pagans are praying for daylight. The heathens who don't believe in God, the pagans who believe in many gods are praying. And the three Christians, <laughs> Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus. And I thought, boy, that'd be a great name for a punk rock band, wouldn't it? The Pagans, the Heathens, and the Three Christians. I think that would sell. Just by the way. Verse 30. Verse 30. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Isn't this fascinating? Isn't this fascinating? Remember, storms don't make you what you are. They reveal who you are. And this moment is revealing a little bit about the sailor's character. Right? They, they're, 
they are not the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers are still invested. They're on duty. They have prisoners in their charge. But the sailors, they have zero investment left. They really don't care anymore about the soldiers, their passengers, or the prisoners, their passengers, or the cargo because it's mostly gone, or even their ship owner. They probably aren't going to make any money anymore either. It is literally every man for himself. But think about it. That's a hard place to be in life, isn't it? When you get to a point that you stop caring for everyone and everything else in your life because you're just trying to survive. That's a hard place to be. I remember when a group of us were in South Sudan and we were on this trip going from point A to point B this one day and right near the United Nations building in Kajokeji, we saw a hut and it had three words scrolled, scrolled on it. It said, sex for help. And I thought, how desperate. How desperate was that person that they would write that on their hut? They were just trying to survive. And even though it reveals, this story reveals the, the, the sailors' selfishness that they're going to, you know, secretly, they have this plan to get on the, the, the dinghy boat, the small boat, and, and escape. They were just trying to survive. Well, verse 31. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Paul, like a captain. Remember I said last time, he's moved from captive to captain. And he now has Julius the centurion's ear. Um, and so he says, these sailors have to stay on the boat in order for you to live. Do you hear the subtext there? I am going to live. I am going to make it to Rome. God has promised me that. But your life is in doubt. Your life is in doubt. And it brings up this whole will of God conversation again, doesn't it? See, Paul and Julius are having a conversation. I think it might have gone something like this. Julius says, but Paul, you said we're going to make it. Like an angel told you that. And Paul says to Julius, yes, but God's sovereignty includes in the equation human responsibility. And so God has also revealed to me that the men have to stay on the boat for us to be saved. I mentioned earlier about prayer and how sometimes people come to a pastor or to the elders for prayer. Um, imagine if someone came to the elders and said, hey, will you pray for me? Well, sure, absolutely. Prayer for what? Well, a job. And so we pray for that person to get a job. But then acting in our role as shepherds, we might ask the question, are you out looking for work? And they might say, no, that sounds like work, to look for work. You need to start praying, like everything depends on God, and you need to start working to find work like everything depends on you. Because that's God's sovereignty and man's, human's responsibility, working together. Or maybe they come and they say, I'd like prayer for my marriage. Absolutely. And we pray. And then as shepherds, we're going to ask the question, how are you loving your wife? Are you serving her like Christ serves his bride, the church? So you want God to be sovereign and change your circumstances without you being responsible and obeying what he said? Yes. <laughs> or maybe someone says, um, Pastor, could you pray for my health? Absolutely, let's pray. And we pray. And then I might ask, how are you doing with eating healthy and with exercising? Um, that sounds like work. I mean, I pray for God's strength to stop me from eating that third or fourth triple chocolate brownie, but it's just not working. <laughs> right, it's not working. Human responsibility is part of God's sovereignty. Does that make sense? 
Yes, it, it so often is a part of the equation. Well, Julius has a lot of pull, obviously, with the captain and the pilot and the owner of the ship. And so look at verse 32. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Now think about this for a minute. Cutting loose the lifeboat is like throwing away a parachute on an airplane. Right? Oh, by the way, those who fly, do you take a parachute with you? I always pack a parachute. I, yeah, it's a, it's a disguised carry-on. And I say disguised because if we're going down, I don't want anyone else to find out that I have a parachute. Right? Because they're going to fight me for it. You say, even Karen? Yes, even Karen. She can pack her own pair of shoes. Pair of shoes. Now, I'd give her my parachute, obviously. I usually bring two anyway. So. Now, the, the, the big purpose of the smaller boat was not actually a lifeboat. Right? Modern day ships, there needs to be enough room in every lifeboat for everyone on the ship. Not at this time. That's not really what this was. This, when you think about it, this was a small boat in tow that was used to bring a small party to shore. I mean, they're approaching an island. There is no deep water docking here. And so the only way in the scenario for someone to get to shore would be in the small boat a few people at a time, kind of like Claire bringing his three at a time, right? Otherwise, they're going to swim. Okay. Now, I was going to move on. I was going to move on from this verse, this text, to the next part of the narrative, but God's Spirit said, wait a minute. And I'd really love us all to listen for a moment, because I felt like this was a, a, a God moment as I was preparing, that there is someone here, or someone who is going to hear this in the future, who is making a private plan to jump ship on a commitment they've made in their life. And God wants you to hear him say, cut the lifeboat rope. Let it go. And stay with the ship. I don't know who this is for or what's going on in your life, but God cares about you too much not to tell you that he's got you in your circumstances. Let your plan drift away. Because if you don't, you're in danger of drifting away. Cut the lifeboat ropes. Verse 33, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. Notice this, for the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Interesting, right? Remember we said last time that uh, uh, anxiety kills the appetite. And so they're not eating because of the constant suspense. What an insight we have. Um, three more verses, okay? Verse 34, now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. Wow, what a promise. What a promise. I I've got a question, though. Was this promise and the hope that it would bring any good to the person who heard it and didn't believe it? I hear what you're saying, Paul. We're all going to survive. Not one hair of our head is going to be lost. But if you don't believe it, guess what? There's zero hope with that. See, some people say, I'm glad that Christian faith works for you. I don't need it, but hey, glad it makes you happy. People who say that don't realize the position they're in. They don't realize the condition they're in. They don't realize how lost and hopeless they are without Jesus. And so, of course, they're going to be happy for you, but it means nothing to them. There's no hope in that. But for the person who believes, this promise brings hope. Well, then look at verse 35. After Paul said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. This has a Lord's Supper communion feel to it, doesn't it? 
It really does. He takes bread, he gives thanks for it, he breaks it in front of them, and he begins to eat. Now, I was thinking, he must have raised his voice here, right? Because there's a storm going on all around. He's saying, men, we're going to take bread, and we're going to give thanks for it. Can you imagine them looking at each other? Did he say, we're all dead, yeah. and the ship sinks? That's not even good English, but what did he say? I mean, he would have had to yell this, right, in, in, in this prayer. I got a question for you. What are your thoughts about stopping and giving thanks to God for whatever meals you eat each, each day? I was raised in a home in a church where that was our practice. And you know what? It was 100% fine in my life until I got to high school. And uh, so one day of the week, really near our high school, there was a lady in our church named Irene, and her adult daughter, Joan, would come home from lunch, and they would host us every Friday for lunch. Well, it was easy to bow our head and give thanks at the table. No problem. Bunch of Christian kids and these Christian ladies. But Monday through Thursday, sitting with my friends in the cafeteria, that was a different deal. And here's what it looked like for many of those years in high school. Here's the food. We're all sitting down, and Gord would go like this. And I would pray. I mean, in, inside, I'd say, thank you, Jesus, for this food, and I love you, and I'm keeping this prayer short. Amen. <laughs> right? And probably over the years, one of my friends said, hey, Gord, how come every time we eat, you scratch your forehead? <laughs> and I might have said, you guys need to practice better Hygiene, I wouldn't be so itchy. I don't know what I said, but I was embarrassed to pray in that way. And I, I often wonder what the Lord thought of my, my heart there. But it's a question. Is it a hard and fast New Testament command to give thanks for a meal? And if so, if so, I'm serious about this, then as disciples of Jesus who love Jesus, we should want to. Now, if it's not a command, we want to always land on the side of grace, and it's up to the individual follower of Jesus. But what does God say about it? I mean, I want to know. Do you want to know? Okay, four people want to know. Well, there are a half dozen scriptures that have eating food and thanking God in close proximity to each other. So, let's read them and ask, what is God's Spirit saying to us through these words of His? And we'll do so against the backdrop of a platter of colorful and delicious-looking Eritrean food. Okay, I first had a platter just like that in Ethiopia and did not enjoy it at all. But today, I love it. <laughs> My palate has changed. So, feeding of the 5,000 plus, it's in all four gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And here's, here's one of them. It says, he, Jesus, took the loaves of bread and the fish and giving thanks. He broke them and started giving them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the people. Well, is it possible that this is an exceptional case? I mean, this is going to be a very significant provision of food, and so Jesus gives thanks to God for it. Is that a possibility? Well, sure. There's even an interesting post-feeding the 5,000-plus miracle reference in John 6 and 23. Look what it says. Uh, Some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Isn't that interesting that it ties the, we ate bread, but, and he gave thanks. Okay, now, how about Lord's Supper communion? It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in 1 Corinthians 11. And here's what it says. When he, Jesus, had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, and likewise the cup. But again, is it possible that this is exceptional? It could be that, you know, this is the Lord's Supper communion, and it deserves a special thank you to God. Well, again, maybe. So let's look at some that actually refer to eating meals. In Romans 14, 6, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat 
does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. The first observation I make is that vegetarians don't need to be grateful. Because it's only if you eat meat. I don't think that's the case, right? And notice there's no mention of giving thanks for Brussels sprouts anywhere in Scripture, okay? Made that observation before. But here it is, eating meat, eating food, and giving thanks. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 30 to 31. If I take part in the meal with thankfulness... Why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So what, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. But isn't that interesting? I take a meal with thankfulness. A couple more. 1 Timothy 4, they order, who, who's they? The false teachers that were plaguing the church at that time. They order people to abstain from certain foods which God created, notice this, to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. And that's where the whole term, say the blessing, say the blessing, the idea of consecrating a meal in a blessing. That's where that comes from. Just two more. Deuteronomy 8, verse 10, the Old Testament. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Do you know that many Dutch Christians give thanks after their meal, and this is the verse they reference. I remember being at a Dutch family's home and we gave thanks for the meal very very briefly at the front end and then after the meal, a very extensive, kind of like a Hebraic, Hebraic prayer of thanking God for each individual thing and how he created each thing. That was a big thing, apparently, among Dutch Christians. Maybe it still is to give thanks after the meal. Um, so that's the last verse, though, is our text right here. Paul took some bread and gave thanks in front of them all. So what do you think? What do you think? There is no thus saith the Lord. However, there's a pretty clear inference. And I land on, why wouldn't I? God is so good and so worthy of my gratitude, I'll take any opportunity that I can to say, thank you, Lord. And even if my love for Jesus isn't where it could be, I can get over my personal embarrassment in public and give thanks for my meal. I I want you to notice something else before we move on, see where I've highlighted or underlined. He gave thanks to God in front of them all. I know I've shared with you before that when I was 15 years old, one of my best friends in the world was an 85-year-old man named George. He really was. It was such a neat mutual friendship. I wanted to learn from him. I respected him so much, but he also took a deep interest in all the young people. And he took quite an interest in me and mentored me. And I've told you before about how he took us out open air preaching and different things. And I learned so much from George. Um, But this one time, he took a whole group of young people and we were going to some Bible conference. I think it was like Clinton. So from Collingwood to Clinton. And somewhere we stopped in some little town and, and he was buying us lunch. And when it arrived at our table, we thought, well, he's gonna ask one of us to give thanks, probably, but no, this was different. Because this is the mentor, right? And he was always asking us to do things and so on. But he was gonna give thanks. He said, well, give thanks for the food. Well, if he didn't stand up, right beside the end of the table. So here's the table, here's all of us, and he's standing up, but he doesn't turn, he turns this way and prays out loud so the whole small little restaurant can hear him giving thanks. Now, I didn't look up while he prayed, but I remember afterwards, everyone was frozen. (laughs) No one was eating because this guy's giving thanks for the meal. But you know what? We all got talking afterwards, like with George wasn't around, and we went, he did that on purpose. That was intentional. This guy was such a witness, like even in the prayer, man, he gave thanks for Jesus. God sent his son to save sinners like us. It was amazing. He was such an amazing man. But like Paul, he gave thanks to God in front of them all. 
I remember hearing the story of a pastor that I really respect. He's on Right Now Media called Skip Heidzig. And Skip's a part of the Calvary Chapel churches from the Jesus Revolution movement and so on. But uh, he told this story about being in what we would call Service Ontario in the U.S., the DMV. And he's in line. There's a big line up to get their business done with licensing. And someone to in front of him turns around and says, oh, Pastor Heidzig, I have a question for you about death and resurrection. Could I ask it right now? And he said, sure. And so he asks the question out loud and Skip starts answering the question out loud. Well, if someone from like four up says, oh, I have a question about that. And he asks the question. And so now there's a three-way conversation going on and no one wants to leave the line because like you don't want to get out of line. And Skip said, it was perfect. <laughs> it was perfect. Because <laughs> this opportunity in front of all these, this captive audience to share Jesus. Oh, to have that boldness. I don't know what your response to those stories are. I, I say, oh, to have that boldness to share my love for Jesus in that way. Well, our final verse, verse 36. They were all encouraged. Isn't that amazing? And ate some food themselves. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, your faith matters to you and it matters to those in your life. Paul had been asking them to trust in his faith in God. That's what he'd been asking because they may have not had any of their own. But your faith can encourage others. Sometimes it's indirectly as people are just watching and observing how you deal with the struggles in your life. But sometimes as you engage with people directly, just the way Paul did with these men. Listen to these five powerful words that can encourage people. May I pray for you. May I pray for you. That's what Paul did here. He prayed for them, with them, and it encouraged them. And I want to close with this. At two-by-two two prayer this past Monday night, we had a maximum encouragement through unity coming to faith in Jesus. But another moment for me was when Izu and I met a fellow. I call him Sammy. What did I call him? Sammy the Muscular Nigerian. So the first thing I said to him was, did you just come from the gym? And he went, no, I didn't, but he was you know, quite a muscular looking fellow. And I won't go into all of our conversation other than Sammy is very lonely. He's only been here for two months and he's just wandering the streets when he's not at school because he's just extremely lonely. And we talked with him for a while and I could tell that encouraged him. But then Izu prayed, and I happened to look up when Izu prayed, and Sammy was wiping the tears from his face continually. It meant something very deeply encouraging to Sammy. And I don't doubt that that relationship will continue with Izu and Sammy. We can encourage people by those five words. Can I pray for you? Storm or no storm at the moment in your life, are you on a God watch? Are you looking for God? Jesus said that his mission, I close with this, Jesus said his mission was, I have come to seek and save those who are lost. There's a Savior seeking you. Are you seeking him? Because a seeking Savior and a seeking sinner are sure to meet. But it takes both. He's seeking you. Are you seeking him? Let's pray. David. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the revelation of yourself through your word. God, we thank you that in the moments of our, our lives, sometimes there's really bright, sunny days, but then sometimes there's really dark, stormy ones. 
God, help us to never forget in the daylight the things that we learn in the darkness. God, you are speaking to someone here today about their need for you. God, I pray that you just open our hearts to the reality of a Savior who is seeking us, who has done everything possible to have a relationship with us and is just waiting, knocking on our heart's door, asking us to open the door and let him in. Father, I pray for my friends today, any especially who are have never invited Jesus in, that they would do that today. They would simply say, I am the sinner that Jesus was on a rescue mission for. I believe he came to the cross to die for a person like me, to pay for my sins, and to forgive me. And I receive him now as my Lord and as my Savior. Help me now to follow Jesus all the days of my life. God, thank you for Paul, for his witness, his courageous boldness to watch for you in the storm and to make such a significant difference that 276 people, their lives were changed in some way. God, draw us to yourself, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.